So everybody here have, familiar with the term eco-modernism? No. That came up a number of years ago. Uh, um, Michael Schellenbrenner and Ted Norhouse were kind of spearheaded the movement of about a dozen environmentalists. They're coming out of traditional um, environmental groups and have become somewhat disillusioned with the approach the approaches seem more ideological, they were evidence-based always, they were metrics-based. One of the things, that the central kind of uh, theme is the idea that instead of trying to harmonize with nature, to really reduce human, the impacts of human activity, more often better to intensify technologically and make more room for nature. So if we like the most obvious example, you move more people into cities, there's nothing more unnatural than a city, right? But the more people live in cities and the less in suburbs, the more room there is for forests and marshes and rivers and lakes, right? Um, so this leads to looking at things like nuclear energy, biotech breeding, and agriculture, and that more often than not, we can lower our footprint by intensifying technologically instead of trying to reduce our technological, you know, trying to do things in less technological ways. It usually ends up taking up more space. So rewilding and giving more room back to nature instead of trying to make civilization more like nature is a core theme. The last 10 years, innovation in the food system has been a big topic. There's always some new farmers markets, vertical farms, uh, can't even keep track of it. You know, there's always some new next best thing. So we're going to look at the algorithm I've developed to try to assess. You know, I want to help you as news consumers, citizens, voters, try to assess this barrage of information. Number one, we want to, if somebody's proposing something <coughs> as a, you know, this is going to revolutionize feeding the world, we want to be like, well, is it going to address a major challenge? So we're going to look, like, so, what, like, lawns into food. Everybody get rid of your lawn, plant a garden. It's a lovely idea, great idea. I encourage everybody to do it. But at the end, maybe we'll look at what the major challenges are and assess is something like that really going to address any of the major challenges. Um, but this is a paper from just a couple years ago. It was a global food systems paper. Some of the top researchers looked at leverage points for um, improving food systems to deal with the major issues. And what they identified for the U.S. is irrigation and water consumption, excess nitrogen use, excess phosphorus use, and uh, nitrogen. Uh, active, uh, reactive nitrogen emissions. Um, in Brazil, it's the deforestation, the rainforest. Similar problems around the world, a little different mix depending on where you are. I'm going to try to mostly focus on the U.S. because that's what we have some impact on. We'll spill into some other issues. Um, so, these are the six that I am always considering. Everything else to me is secondary. Greenhouse gas emissions, this is really two, nutrient management and the nutrient cycle. So nutrient management is how a farmer manages their use of 
nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. So are they using as little as possible to get the best yield? Because there is um, a ton of energy used to produce synthetic nitrogen. Phosphorus is mined, and there are limited supplies. We can run out someday. So um, you want to manage them, and then you don't want them running into streams, and then into brooks, and then into rivers, and then into uh, the Des Moines water system, and then into the Gulf of Mexico, and turning the Gulf of Mexico into a giant lily pad. Soil health is big. We've lost tons, of, you know, disconcertingly large amounts of topsoil. A lot of soil that we do have has been depleted of organic matter and nutrients. Water conservation and management. We have like the Oklahoma, we had the drought in uh, California. And there's a saying that, uh, what is it? Like a, a shortage of rain is a natural phenomenon. A drought is man-made, which is overstating a little bit. But generally, a drought happens because you haven't been managing your water supply in advance of a shortage of rain. The even more concerning, really, than water use issues, I mean, it's a toss of the West, whether it's California or uh, what's the big river through the Grand Canyon, down oh, the Colorado. Colorado, Colorado River. Huge water management issues. Um, but the big one today is the Ucala Aquifer under massive amounts in the Midwest. When that goes dry, bingo, it's game over, lights out for that part of the country. And we are not gotten our water use efficient enough. So that's at a rate of refresh where it's going back up, it's still going back down. Land use deforestation, rewilding is a big one that people aren't involved in ag. And people in general, even environmentalists, uh, thinking about other issues, have a hard time really internalizing. Land is an input, right? Every acre you use, if, if, if I can grow, round numbers, 100 bushels on an acre versus 50 bushels on an acre, now I only need one acre to get 100 bushels instead of two acres. So I can have one acre of corn and one acre of forest, right? That's a simple model. That's the basic idea. Um, so you want to stop deforestation, if possible, it would be great to rewild. And actually, the footprint of agriculture in America is slightly smaller than it was like 30, 40 years ago. Despite the fact that, you know, it's smaller than I think it was in 1970, population was what, 200 million? 150, 200 million? In 1970, we're at 320 now. That's intensification, right? That's the fruits of technological intensification. We are, that's not, we I mean, that didn't shrink the footprint of that while feeding another 50% of people, citizens, and increasing exports by making farming more like nature. We just squeezed every bit we could out of every acre. Um, and food waste is another, I'm going to touch on that tangentially, that doesn't touch so much on kind of agro-modernist themes, but it's massive. It may be the most important variable of all. It's like energy. You can only efficiency your way or build capacity your way so much when mostly, you know, we're wasting something on the order of 40% of food ends up in the landfill or plowed under in this country. There's no innovation that could match cutting food waste by half in terms of environmental impact.
But that's a devilish, that's a, a wicked, it's a borderline wicked problem. I mean, is that there's an old uh, joke among academic economists that graduate student says, to a Professor, oh, there's a $20 bill on the sidewalk. The professor doesn't look dead. He's, that's impossible. If there's a $20 bill, somebody would have picked it up by now. <laughs> like, food waste. There are people losing money on food waste. If it was easy to fix, we would have fixed it by now. It's incredibly hard for 20 reasons plus 20 more. Mm -hmm. Can this problem scale in a significant way? That's massively important. It, it, like we, we're, what, the reason why I wanted to compare uh, organic agriculture, organic farming in America, 2.5 million acres. They're still trying to figure out no-till. Organic farmers mostly control their weeds by plowing their fields. Organic does a lot right about their soil. On average, have better soil health than an average conventional farmer. But tillage is a problem. You get wind erosion, water erosion, brings up soil structure, you get all the greenhouse gas emissions, blah, blah, blah. They've had no-till on a mass scale and conventional for 20 years because of the GMO soy and corn that allows for no-till. They're still trying to figure out, there are researchers working on this problem because it's important in agriculture and, and organic. But it's not going to be adopted by all, on all 2.5, best case scenario, 100% adoption on every acre. It's still only 2.5 million acres of cropland. Meanwhile, you know, when we saw the 40% in soybeans of conservation tillage, that's what, uh, 35 million acres? One innovation, boom. Um, so, how can things scale? One is, you pick a big stage, right? We're gonna, if you can make commodity corn farming more sustainable, you can argue all day whether we should be growing so much corn or not. It doesn't matter. That's how much we're growing. So, and, and I'll, I'm going to talk about some ways that we can produce that amount in ways that would improve the impact effect. But the biggest thing in agriculture you can do is make corn production more sustainable. It doesn't solve an economic problem. If this doesn't put money in somebody's pocket, if this doesn't, there's not an incentive to make this go, it's not going to scale. I had an example today of like a good idea that would be great, except like there's no like, uh, well, it's one of the reasons why Organic farming is still like, I, I was a chef before, yeah, I was a chef before I did this. I was, I've done a couple of things. I was trying to figure out. <laughs> um, so I've been paying attention, like, in, you know, the kind of restaurants I worked at, it's all local, organic, free range chicken. So I've been paying attention to this stuff for a long time. I've been told, like, organic is growing at 10% a year every year for the past 20 years. Well, anybody knows it, anything about compounding interest, you know, it, if it's been doing that, it would cover the Earth and the Moon and Mars and Venus by now. It constitutes 0.6% of acreage in the U.S. It has stalled out, it's like, at a certain level, organic farming doesn't solve any economic problems for farmers. It solves a problem for consumers who want a sense, either a sense of uh, lowering the, their impact or cleaner food or, you know, more authentic food or whatever. But that, there's a, apparently a ceiling to that. And it, it's never, 
solved any problems for farmers, created economic problems for farmers. That's why it costs more. So that's why it doesn't scale. Does it require a larger social reform in order to succeed on its own? This occurred to me when Vladimir Putin In, I think it was because he invaded Crimea or Ukraine. The, the EU put sanctions on him, so he put sanctions on them. He stopped importing uh, milk from Europe. Well, then Russian cheesemakers couldn't make cheese. And he had some complicated fix, bureaucratic fix, to fix that. Like the simple problem was going to be fixed by it, the, their bureaucrats who got money. They decided which farmers to get how much money. You know, this whole Rube Goldberg system, right? For, like, if the simple problem requires, you know, like Michael Pollan, we should include the full cost of externalities in our food. So, food should be more expensive. And people go, well, what about low-income people? Well, you know, we need to fight poverty and raise weight, you know, like, we need to raise the minimum wage and bring back unions and, um, you know, like, 12 other things that we do not have the political will to do by any stretch of the imagination. So if your little reform needs a much bigger reform in order to work, my guess is it's not going to kind of get wings and take off. Um, so let's look at scale a little bit. Large conventional farms, 638 million acres. That's it's a fairly arbitrary definition of a large farm. I picked 500 acres um, in commodity crops. That's still considered a small farm. In, uh, if you're grazing, that's small. Um, a better measure would have been by income, but like the drunk looking for his, you know, keys under the lamp. This is the data I had. So it's 500 acres. It's a big farm, smaller is um, 273 million acres. This is a small conventional farm. Organic farms bigger than 500 acres, 1.5 million acres, small organic, 1 million. Now look at this, and I think, like, when you read the New York Times about reforming the food system, making it more sustainable, you would think that organic makes up like 30% of all agriculture in the U.S. It's 0.6%. Why are we having a discussion about how to make these bigger? Let's double them. Who cares? <laughs> Let's make this and this more sustainable. If we make this 10% more sustainable, that's a much bigger deal than doubling this, even if I thought organic was more sustainable, which I don't. But even granting that, double it. I don't care. 10% better. Right there, that's the grail. Crop acreage. So again, when we're talking about farming, you probably think of them maybe like I used to flash on maybe the produce section at the grocery store, or you know a farm outside uh, a CSA outside of Portland where I live that you know they drop off a box with 45 different vegetables and 10 I've never heard of it. Three. I'll eat anything. I still won't eat them. <laughs> so this is soybeans, forage, corn, hay, wheat. So 65 million. This is corn for just for food. And again, I fudged the number. It's hard to really <coughs> break it out. They say 40% of four um, Corn goes into ethanol, so I just use that. I've had the economists from the Corn Growers Association bitch at me because a lot of that then comes back 
has fed to livestock after they make effort. So whatever, doesn't matter whether it's here or here. It's a lot bigger than this. This is orchards, um, 5 million acres, 4 million acres of vegetables. All vegetables in the U.S., 4 million acres. Uh, canola, beans, beets, berries. I don't know why beets get their own <laughs> sugar. Um, sugar. Oh, yeah. sugar. Oh, yeah. Sugar, those aren't vegetable beets, those are sugar beets. <laughs> so the beets are probably down here again. Also, we did this a couple of months ago when I looked at it again today. I was like, forage and hay. Not really clear why those are broken. I sort of know. I don't understand it well enough to explain it to you. You probably don't care or need to know. Potatoes, one million acres. Sweet corn, lettuce, canned tomatoes, and then onions, and it drops off. I mean, carrots, you think they're in everything. Onions, I think onions are in everything. This is uh, 250,000 acres right here. That's 175,000 acres of onions. They're in every freaking thing I eat all day long. Um, so when you're talking about making, when you're talking about farming, you're talking about this. If you're talking about making farming sustainable, you're talking about this, by and large. Um, frustratingly, like, there's been uh, a BT potato for like a decade or more that would allow you to grow potatoes without insecticides or much less insecticides. To do that, you need, what do you need on your side? You need McDonald's. McDonald's wouldn't do it because they didn't want to have the discussion with their customers. They're, and it takes a lot of insecticides to grow potatoes because potatoes don't rotate well with other crops. They just grow like Maine, Idaho. They grow potatoes. Nothing else grows there. You're stuck with potatoes. So you can't break up the pest cycle by just moving in another crop. So they just spray it with a lot of insecticides. It was easier for McDonald's to keep selling, and I don't want to, insecticide use is very safe for the consumer. Maybe not for local communities, farm workers. I don't want to fear monger about insecticides and potatoes, but it was easier to just keep using insecticides on potatoes, one of the highest insecticide use, and to have a conversation with their customers and say, hey, we can use a lot less insecticides in your french fries with these biotech potatoes. But it was too difficult a conversation because of all the fear mongering. Couple, I'm giving myself too much credit. It's not really biology 101. <laughs> um, these are three things related to biology that I think about when I'm assessing whether I think an idea matters. What does farming require? Farming requires soil, sun, space, lots of space, 90 million acres for corn, 65 million acres for soy. Tyson, there's a lot of food innovations that are supposed to revolutionize the food system that are denominated in square feet. Farming is not denominated in square feet. Farming is denominated in tens of thousands, if not millions of acres. Protein is the bottleneck. Nitrogen is biologically expensive. It's energetically expensive to make it synthetically. It's expensive in within um, ecosystems to produce it. Carbs are cheap There's, because it's ecologically cheap, because carbon's ecologically cheap. What plants do is pull carbon out of the air via photosynthesis and turn it into cell structure. Now, like one day the light went off in my head, like why there wasn't a hole 
where the plant, where the seed used to be. Like I kind of had this model of the soil being turned into the plant. The plant is just carbon pulled out of the air, right? The, and it, that's a very uh, fairly efficient, very easy chemical reaction. Nitrogen in the air, 75% of our air is nitrogen, but it's a triple bond. It's a very powerful bond. It's hard to break. It's expensive. That's why protein is expensive. So, an air elevation doesn't have to deal with the bottleneck of protein, but that's definitely one of my considerations. If, if I'm going to take something seriously, I generally want to see it dealing with the problem of lowering the impact of protein production or in developing nations making protein uh, cheaper and more available to citizens. Entropy versus conversion. Livestock are warm-blooded animals. They're throwing off heat all day long trying to maintain a stable uh, body temperature, right? So and they, they require lots of energy, lots of water, and they create major <laughs> waste streams in converting energy into fat and protein. Plants and insects and single-celled organisms, on the other hand, do not come, they are not warm blooded. They're cold blooded or they don't have blood. Um, they're not trying to maintain a uh, homeostatic uh, body temperature, which is a huge, in, it's hugely inefficient in terms of harnessing a biological system to make protein and fat. On the other hand, in defense of livestock, there's a ton of area of land mass covered by highly dense cellulosic uh, plants that humans can't eat, but grazing animals can, and they transform them into milk and meat and turn land that we could not use to produce food for humans into useful, delicious, nutritious food. So those are things you need to take into account and think about when you're assessing different, you know, which of those are you harnessing? So grazing harnesses that. Feed lot feeding doesn't. Although even that is more efficient than you might think. I still don't support it. <laughs> um, but it's a much more of a push than you might think.